Thank you very much. The next item of business this afternoon is a statement by Michael Russell on an update from the Scottish Government on the proposed UK-EU withdrawal agreement and political declaration. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so anybody who wishes to ask a question, I would urge them to press their request to speak button as soon as possible, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful for the opportunity at this important moment in the Brexit process to update the Chamber. Though, given the speed of current developments, I'm not confident I'll be able to cover everything or that things will have not have changed again before I sit down. However, at the outset, let me say I make this statement with a heavy heart. Scotland voted to stay in the EU in June 2016 by 62% to 38%. To be dragged out of the EU against our will is democratically wrong and will be deeply resented by many in this country. Those of us who regard ourselves as Europeans and Scots and whose life experience has been embedded in that identity will feel particularly sad and sore. Now, no doubt there are others who will rejoice at what is taking place, and I respect their view. But it is fair to note that the experience of Brexit and the demonstration of Tory incompetence over the last two years has not only resulted in a growing number of those who wish to remain in the EU, but also in a diminution in those who are in any way persuaded by the empty bluster of the Conservative Party in Scotland on these matters. Today's polls tell that story. I believe a future election would confirm it. But this is a sad day nonetheless, a day in which spin, rhetoric, the misuse of funds and the manipulation of electoral legislation has led to the worst and most damaging decision made by a UK government in any of our lifetimes. A day in which the UK government has attempted voluntarily and for its own selfish political purposes to actually lower the standard of living for all the citizens of Scotland and to distance itself from the global benefits of the world's largest free trade bloc. The Prime Minister last night described this proposed agreement as the best that could be obtained in the circumstances. But what a difference a day makes, particularly to circumstances. Her deal was the inevitable result of a series of self-imposed draconian red lines, the wish to turn her back on sensible cooperation across our continent, and the loose talk and empty rhetoric of her cabinet who have shown contempt for evidence-based policymaking. And the death of her deal over the past 24 hours, for it is now essentially dead, arises from the same insularity, the same wrong-headedness, and the same arrogance. She has only herself to blame for the appalling circumstances she has found herself in. Appalling circumstances not just for her, but for all of us on these islands. Presiding officer, there's been much analysis of the deal already, despite the fact that the details are still not as clear as they should be, particularly with regard to the political declaration. But briefly, this deal, first of all, maintains a form of customs union for a period of time for all of these islands. That is in itself welcome, but because it is partial, does not include any of the advantages of the single market, and may be temporary, it is nowhere near good enough. Secondly, it makes a differentiation between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK in similar terms to those which we suggested for Scotland two years ago. Thirdly, it prepares the ground for a continuing betrayal of our fishing interests. Fourthly, it fails to guarantee key rights, human rights, environmental rights, employment rights, which we need and which we should never give up. And finally, by its language and outcomes, it continues to ignore the current devolution settlement and the democratic institutions in Scotland and Wales. Indeed, as the Prime Minister herself confirmed this morning, Scotland does not exist in her thinking about this deal. A fact very tellingly illustrated by the distinguished blogger and legal writer David Alan Green, when he pointed out this morning on Twitter that the document that outlines the deal does refer to the British Antarctic Territory, but makes no mention at all of Scotland. Presiding officer, in summary, this proposed deal does not meet the frequently stated Scottish Government requirement of single market and customs union membership for the whole of the UK, which failing for Scotland. Does not make even a gesture towards recognising the vote of Scotland to remain. Does not tackle the considerable and grave problems that will be caused by Scotland coming out of the single market and customs union. Takes away the four freedoms, and in particular freedom of movement, which is essential for Scotland, and fails to address in any way the additional pressures on Scotland if its neighbour in Northern Ireland retains the advantages of single market and customs union involvement. It cannot therefore be supported by this government or by the SNP. Presiding officer, much of Scotland looks at the current state of the UK government and Brexit with astonishment and resentment. Scotland is an outward focused European nation 
we voted to remain within the European Union. It is clear that we would do so again tomorrow if a similar referendum was held. The Scottish Government has been clear and remains clear that the best outcome for Scotland is to be within the EU. But, and it is a big but, that has cost the Scottish Government a great deal of effort, we have repeatedly tried to find a compromise position which would allow the UK Government and the Scottish Government to move forward, but to no avail. So what is to be done? Well, first of all, we should take some heart from a major development just this week when the leaders of all the opposition parties at Westminster, including Jeremy Corbyn and Vince Cable, took action to ensure that there will be the opportunity for other proposals to be put when the so-called meaningful vote is heard. There are many alternatives that might be considered, including the Scottish Government policy of remaining in the single market and the customs union, as well as an EEA model, remaining in the EU, as the Prime Minister herself let slip, it is an option, yesterday, so no one can argue that the choice is whatever the Prime Minister says it is. The choice will be what the people and their elected representatives say it should be. We will therefore, as a party in the House of Commons, continue to work in a constructive and common sense way with other opposition parties to try and save us from the chaos of this Tory Brexit. And I commit the Scottish Government to the same constructive working which we have tried to carry forward in this chamber with other parties during the Brexit period. But, presiding officer, not only is this a bad deal, it is being pursued in a bad way. The presentation of a totally false choice to try and bludgeon MPs and others to support the Prime Minister is one sign of that. Another is the actions of the UK Government, which have sought to restrict the powers of this Parliament and which have already imposed upon us legislation against our will. This is not just a bad deal because it will damage our future relationship with Europe, but because it also creates the pretext for a continued unconstitutional assault on the rights and privileges of the people of Scotland as exercised through this Parliament. It is an attempt to unsettle the will of the Scottish people, whilst eroding the rights of and imperiling the future prosperity of everyone who lives in this country. So, presiding officer, what is being offered is unacceptable, and so is what is not being offered. This deal provides for a degree of differentiation in Northern Ireland which we fully support as essential to the future functioning of the Irish border and the protection of the Good Friday Agreement. We want that to happen. We will do everything we can to help it happen. And of course, whilst the deal provides for the whole of the UK to be within a customs union within the EU, thus rendering Liam Fox's job redundant at the stroke of the negotiator's pen, there will also, we understand, be specific provisions, including single market alignment provision, which will only apply to Northern Ireland. That will see a better level of access to the European market for Northern Ireland compared to other parts of the UK. We rejoice for Northern Ireland that this has been achieved, but we cannot accept it be achieved only for Northern Ireland. The Scottish Government has been arguing since December 2016 that if the UK leaves the single market, Scotland should remain. But in January 2017, within weeks of the publication of Scotland's Place in Europe, I was told to my face by David Davis in his own office in the House of Commons that differentiation could not work in these islands and would not be proposed by the UK government. But now Northern Ireland rightly is to receive that special status, yet we alone of the four nations will get nothing we voted for. England and Wales voted leave and they will leave, even though polls now show that the majority in Wales is against and much of England is moving that way. Northern Ireland will get a special deal. Even tiny Gibraltar, which was resolute in its need for continued special treatment, which we understood and supported, has been given that special treatment. But Scotland, with the highest Remain vote of any of the UK nations, is to be dragged out of the EU against our will, exposed to severe economic disadvantage and damage, have the powers of our Parliament diminished, and yet receive nothing at all. Enough, presiding officer, is enough. Throughout the long, tortuous process of engagement with the UK government, we have been repeatedly assured of the importance of our views, but those assurances have turned out to be worthless and hollow. So what, presiding officer, do we here in this parliament do next? Well, firstly, we should go on working with others in Scotland, in the UK, and across parties to ensure there is a better deal than the false choice offered by the UK government of this disastrous deal or no deal. An election, the people's vote, remain within that mix. We will also ensure that this Scottish Parliament has the right to give its own view on this deal. And I confirm today that the Scottish Government will bring the deal, if agreed at the Brussels summit on November the 25th, to this chamber for a vote before the vote takes place in the House of Commons.
And of course, our motion will be amendable. That is how a proper parliament should work. But as I said at the beginning of this statement, presiding officer, this is a sad day for those of us who believe and still believe in the importance of European cooperation. Those of us who reject the demonizing of migration, the misrepresentation of cooperation, and the assertion of false claims regarding taking back control and the independence of the UK. Those of us, in other words, who still believe in a better future for our country. Of course, in one sense, we have been here before. The promises made from 2014, lead not leave, for example, have turned out to be worthless. We are not an equal partner, and the events of this week have proved it beyond peradventure. And I know that from each and every meeting of the JMC I have attended on behalf of this government. Far from leading the UK, the people of Scotland have been ignored and dismissed. Westminster has treated and goes on treating Scotland with contempt. But it does not have to be that way. It should not be that way. And I would contend that it is the duty of every elected representative in this place to make sure it isn't allowed to be that way. We should understand that politicians are, if they are anything, people with a vision of a better future, motivated by a burning desire to help our fellow citizens achieve it. Brexit isn't a better future. It's a backward step into a false and imagined past. That is now crystal clear, and every word of this deal proves it to be true. Things in Brexit, presiding officer for Scotland, can only get worse. So we must acknowledge that this deal is unacceptable to Scotland and her citizens. And we must then find a way to work together to ensure that our country is not failed by a disastrous Tory Brexit, but enabled to flourish by choosing a different way forward. Thank you. We'll now move on to questions. Adam Tompkins to be followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This isn't a government statement from a serious minister. It's a cocktail of contrived grievance from someone who, even two years on, has never accommodated himself to the democratic will of the British people that we leave the European Union. Now, I voted Remain too, but the difference between Mike Russell and me is that I respect the result of referendums, and he does not. Unlike some, I was not surprised by yesterday's events. I always thought that the Prime Minister would get a deal with Brussels. I have never advocated a no-deal Brexit, and I've never thought that that would be our fate. Presiding officer, none of us knows whether yesterday's draft withdrawal agreement will survive intact. Getting a deal through a fractious House of Commons was always going to be more difficult than getting a deal with Brussels. And that task has not been made any easier by the sad and unnecessary cabinet resignations we have witnessed this morning. This deal is not perfect. It may or may not survive. And with regard to key elements of it, I myself would frankly reserve my judgment. What I do support, and this is what the cabinet decided yesterday, is that it should now be subject to intense parliamentary and external scrutiny. So I don't rush to judgment neither to celebrate every clause of its 585 pages, nor to condemn it out of hand, as the Minister just sought to do. Presiding officer, I want to ask the Minister about differentiated deals. He wants a deal so differentiated that Scotland would remain in the European Single Market and Customs Union, even while the rest of Great Britain withdraws from both. Is it not the case that he wants that for the very reason that I am resolutely against it, namely that it would destroy the integrity of the United Kingdom, which Scotland voted to remain part of in 2014. Does the Minister not accept that the draft withdrawal agreement published yesterday contemplates nothing of this sort? Its detailed, lengthy and, yes, complex provisions on Northern Ireland are miles away from the SNP's disastrous proposals for an altogether different sort of Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, to address the substance of the question, no, I do not agree. It is quite obvious a reading of, of any of the documents indicates that there are huge similarities in terms of what is being proposed for Northern Ireland and a negotiation that led to an implementation of some of the recommendations of Scotland's Place in Europe, which was published in December 2016, uh, would allow for a, a sensible compromise. 
I think it's more likely that uh, the, the precious union, I notice this word, the union has to be, uh, have the word precious in front of it now for any Tory to talk about it, is more likely to be damaged uh, uh, in the long term and an extremist by the type of dogmatic approach that the Prime Minister has taken and the completely out of touch approach we've heard from Mr. Tompkins. Because I, I believe that on those Tory benches, I know actually on those Tory benches, there are people who know how ridiculous and appalling this situation is now. There are sensible people who would support a sensible way forward, who could not in any way support what they see happening at Westminster, where the Tory party is literally falling to pieces before our eyes. And I do hope that perhaps some of those people might eventually step forward and say, enough is enough. Because that is essentially what I think they should do as representatives of the Scottish people, rather than as conservatives. That will be their choice. But I don't believe, I don't believe that the tone of Adam Tompkins' question does anything other than betray the fact that he may well be one of those people who knows how wrong this is. Neil Findlay to be followed by Ross Greer. Neil Findlay. President officer, in the last 24 hours, we've entered the end game in the 40-year-long civil war in the Tory party over Europe. Two and a half years after Brexit, the Brexit vote were presented with a withdrawal agreement that fails to meet the tests Labour set, and we will not support this bad deal. We've always put Scotland first in this, and this is not a deal that meets the, uh, Scotland's needs, or indeed the needs of other nations and regions of the UK, and it fails to respect devolution. It does not meet our demand for a permanent customs union arrangement. It fails to set out the collaborative and cooperative future with the EU that we want to see. It fails to provide equal access to the single market or guarantee that we'll not fall behind in workers' rights, consumer protection and protection of our environment. This cannot be a choice between a bad deal and a disastrous no deal. And the Cabinet Secretary said he will bring forward a motion to this Parliament. Will he work with me and others um, to, sh to ensure that that motion gathers the widest possible parliamentary support? He spoke of a differentiated border and customs arrangement for Scotland, and the, and the First Minister has spoken about that too. Can I ask what work has been done in this? How will it work? What imp the impact would be? And will he publish the government's plans today? And in relation to Northern Ireland, it is a land border with the EU. We don't. It has a history of conflict. It is the Good Friday Agreement and the will of the people holding the peace. The circumstances there are completely different to Scotland and nothing, nothing must undermine that peace. So does the Cabinet Secretary believe that creating a hard border between Scotland and our biggest market, the rest of the UK, would be in Scotland's interest? And finally, will he do now what the First Minister failed to do at question time? And that is call for an immediate general election so we can rid the country of this shambolic and arrogant Tory government. Cabinet Secretary. Never mind. I, uh, I think the, 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 the First Minister was very clear about that. I mean, quite clearly, there are a range of options on the table, and the general election is one of those options. Uh, and, you know, if a general election takes place, I will be quite happy uh, to campaign uh, alongside my SNP colleagues, who will undoubtedly be taking seats from both of these parties. But, however, however, let's, uh, let's see if we can... Um, Let's uh, see if we can address some of those. First of all, on the question of publishing material, uh, we published Scotland's Place in Europe in December 2016. It contains all that information. I, oh, absolutely contains all that information. And indeed, we have gone on publishing uh, other volumes called Scotland Place in Europe, almost uh, you know, like a serial publication from the 19th century. I'm happy to go on doing so. That information is there. It is in the public domain. Uh, to move then in terms to Northern Ireland, of course, I entirely agree that peace is the absolute most important thing. And I indicated my statement, of course I did. But there are similarities in what could be done in terms of differentiation, which would benefit both sides. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are talking about, and that's what we want to put in place. And it does not include a hard border. Indeed, the whole purpose of the Northern Irish situation is not to have a hard border. Now, let's go to what we could uh, uh, actually uh, bring us together on. I am happy to commit myself to work with Mr. Finlay on the details of a motion to bring to this chamber and to ensure it has the widest possible support. I, I say that to everybody in this chamber, uh, Mr. Finlay, myself, I'm sure that the Greens will want to do so, I'm sure the Liberals will want to do so, and you know, there is no joy in heaven greater than that of a sinner that repenteth if the Tories wanted to take part in that to produce an effective motion that showed that this Parliament, 
this Parliament would speak for Scotland against Brexit, then I'd welcome too. But as Mr Finlay has indicated, I won't get my hopes up for that actually uh, happening. So as far as I'm concerned, we will take this forward as the House parties in the House of Commons are. Because I pointed out that Jeremy Corbyn and Vince Cable have signed with Ian Blackford, with Plaid and with the Greens uh, a, a letter about what would, uh, would take place, uh, 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 they hope to take place in the meaningful vote. Uh, and I, um, I continue to work very closely, and I want to make this point, with my colleague Mark Drakeford on these issues. And both of us were at the JMC on Tuesday, where, as usual, uh, where we received no illumination of any description. Ross Greer to be followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the, the Minister's statement today, and the Greens would, of course, be more than happy to work with the Labour Party and the Scottish Government to try and present as close as possible to a united voice from this Parliament on behalf of Scotland. Now, I understand the Scottish Government's previous reticence to give momentum to a no-deal scenario by publishing material on their preparations for it, but we're well past that point now. No-deal is a very real threat now that the uh, deal on the table, as the Minister has said, is almost certainly set to fall in the House of Commons. We still believe there are other options. We look forward to a ruling from the ECG uh, later this month or early next month on whether Article 50 can be revoked. But the Westminster Health Secretary apparently told the Cabinet last night he couldn't guarantee that people wouldn't die as a result of a no-deal, given the near inevitability of medicine and other shortages. Given the serious amount of concerns and the clear impact on areas of devolved responsibility, will the Scottish Government now publish in full its no-deal preparatory work? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you for, for that question. I actually think the events of the last 24 hours have actually made No Deal much less likely than it was. I think that it has concentrated minds. I think some of the work of people like the Health Secretary in, in, in England has been designed to egg this up and in so doing have actually made it clear to almost everybody that it shouldn't happen. However, we are not going to uh, let up on our own preparations. A very substantial amount of my time uh, over the, the last uh, period has been spent on No Deal issues. Um, I expect to be in a position to come to this uh, uh, chamber with more information on that before Christmas, and I make an undertaking to do so, uh, and I hope that will include publication of some information. But again, uh, Ross Greer makes a very important point. We have to have a very careful judgment between whether we are egging that on and encouraging that and making people think it will happen, or whether we are actually providing reassurance. And I will always consider that to be the most important judgment, but I do uh, give an undertaking that we will say more about this. Tavish Scott to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Deputy Political Editor of the BBC has just tweeted that Tory Minister tells me if Brexiteers vote down the deal, he and others will openly campaign for a second referendum and to stay in the EU. Uh, given the changing position of public opinion that Mr Russell mentioned in his uh, remarks, both in Wales and in parts of England, London, of course, voted to remain, will he get behind that cross-party growing uh, momentum for a people's vote and endorse it here today? Cabinet Secretary. I mean, I, I, I have to say that I am behind it, remain behind it, and will be behind it, because that is the position that the SNP has taken. I, I mean, it clearly, Tavish Scott and his colleagues can't take yes for an answer, because they just don't want to take yes for an answer. We support the People's Vote campaign. That is clear. That is on the record. Now, you know, I, I, and I hope in those circumstances that if that is one of the options that comes through this process and comes through the meaningful vote option, they will find that the SNP will support it. You may not wish us to do so, because clearly you're much happier, the, the, the Liberal Democrats are much happier, presiding officer, constantly asking the question, but I'll go on giving the same answer. Yes, we're behind it. We'll go on being behind it. It may well happen. Thank you. There's considerable interest in this subject, as uh, members can imagine. Uh, at least 10 members wish to get in. Uh, I would urge everyone to be succinct. However, having said that, I am prepared to let the statement run on a little bit, which will have an impact on the afternoon's debate. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you, President Officer. A, a very short quote. There's undoubtedly a need for the devolved administrations to work with the UK government to ensure we deal with, get a deal that reflects the needs of us all. Chiefly amongst this, our continued access to the single market. Protecting our trade with the EU will boost our economy, sustain jobs and help to fund vital public services. Not the words of the First Minister, not the words of the Cabinet Secretary, not even my words, but the words of the Tory leader, Ruth Davidson. Oh. Cabinet Secretary, I am the first to recognise that the circumstances of the Northern Ireland are different to those in Scotland. However, is it still not an entirely legitimate question to ask if the single market access is good enough for Northern Ireland, why is it not good enough for Scotland? And do you agree with Ruth Davidson's comments? 
And what common cause can you have with these pragmatic and sensible Tories you think that exist in this chamber, as well as other parties, to fight for Scotland's interests? Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> My friend Mr Crawford makes a, a very good and sound point and, and of course we could extend it backwards in time to the role of Margaret Thatcher as essentially uh, the, the key midwife for the single market coming into being and her enthusiastic view of the single market. Now the single market has developed and changed and, and it has brought in more acceptable um, issues in terms of, of how um, employment and other conditions but it is something that was and should be valued across this chamber. And what we've actually seen is a very strange set of circumstances where people who supported it and who knew that leaving the single market would be immensely damaging have been persuaded by the wind blowing from their party in Westminster to do a complete volt fast and to pretend that in many ways it doesn't matter. That is simply not true. It matters enormously, particularly as I indicated in my statement in freedom of movement. It is vital for the health of the Scottish economy and for rural Scotland most of all, and I shall be speaking tomorrow at the Scottish Rural Parliament in Rwanda and making that point. So I, I keep hoping that sense will prevail in the Scottish Tory party, forlorn hope perhaps, and that they will recognise that the stance they're taking may help for a very brief period of time, Theresa May, but it will damage the people they're meant to represent. Donald Cameron to be followed by Alex Neil. Thank you. Uh, whereas the Scottish Conservatives publicly sought assurances from the Prime Minister yesterday that the draft deal protects Scotland's fishing interests. Isn't it the case that the Scottish Government's position is to take Scotland straight back into the common fisheries policy and accordingly any betrayal of our fishing interests lies at the door of the SNP? Cabinet Secretary. I, uh, I, presiding officer, I like and respect Donald Cameron and that question is not worthy of him. Because the reality of this situation, the reality of this situation is this: the Scottish, the Conservative Party, have been the enthusiastic uh, supporters and implementers of the Common Fisheries Policy since it started. Yeah. The Scottish National Party has argued and will continue to argue for either, and I think I use the words of the manifesto, to scrap or radically reform the Common Fisheries Policy. There has been a cruel hoax perpetrated on the fishing community in Scotland by the Scottish Conservatives. Yesterday's uh, part of that was a piece of theatre to which they knew the answer, even though that answer was false. Because there is no doubt, reading the documents, that the long, years long, betrayal of the Scottish fishing industry will continue. And I hope Mr Cameron, on reflection, will realise that what he has said adds again to that betrayal. Alec Neil to be followed by Claire Baker. Alec Neil. Thank you very much indeed, the presiding officer. Can I, as someone who voted for Brexit, agree with the Cabinet Secretary that the draft withdrawal agreement is totally unacceptable? It is neither fish nor fowl, it's not in the EU, and it's not out of the EU. And there is much wrong with this draft agreement, but none more so, despite what Donald Cameron says, than another Tory sellout in relation to the future of our fishing industry and our fishing communities, putting at risk again one of the most important industries in rural Scotland. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, when you actually read the document published last night, which obviously Donald Cameron has not, it is very clear, not only is there no deal on Question, fishing, Mr. Neil, please. there is no guarantee that the fishing industry will not be in the common fisheries policy. And does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me? If the Scottish Tories fail to deliver, every one of their MPs should have a moral responsibility to resign their seats if they do in the Scottish, industry, Scottish fishing industry for the second time. First time being Ted Teeth, second time being Theresa May. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I want to make two, and I know time is short, I want to make two quick points about fishing. The first one is I agree that, of course, the Scottish Conservative, 13 Scottish Conservatives should resign, but they're taking their lead, no doubt, from uh, David Mundell, who clearly doesn't want to resign, no matter what he promises. So I, I, can't, I can't do anything other than say that would be the honourable thing for them to do. But let me just make a key point about fishing. I represent a number of fishing communities in Argyll and Butte. They're very different from the interests of fishing that are claimed elsewhere. 
the worry in Argyll and Butte, amongst many fishermen, is access to markets. Yeah. There's access to markets for shellfish, for example. The proposals that Theresa May has on the table do not provide frictionless trade. They create circumstances in which that market access will become ever more difficult. Those are people whose livelihoods are directly threatened by what the Prime Minister is proposing. Those are fishermen and fisherwomen in Scotland who will look at this deal and realise that they are getting nothing, zilch, nada, from the Scottish Conservatives or the, and the Conservatives south of the border. Claire Baker to be followed by June McAlpine. Um, thank you. The government's focus today is, is on arguing for a special deal, but the reality is, following the developments we've seen throughout today, the deal we are deliberating over is on the verge of collapse. But the deal before us does set out a differentiation for Northern Ireland. Is the Cabinet Secretary confident that all of the proposals in Scotland's place in Europe on an open border with England, who, unlike Ireland, would be outside of the EU, are still workable, given the detail of the draft proposal for Northern Ireland? Cabinet Secretary. I am absolutely convinced that uh, you can find, and it would be easy to find, a workable solution to these matters. Those are, those are matters which can be resolved, and differentiation is vitally important in terms of access, particularly to labour. Uh, and the member will know for the region that she represents that there are many industries and many sectors which are already experiencing shortage of labour. And that, will, that can only get worse. Add, and in addition, there's substantial difficulties in terms of wage inflation because workers cannot be found. Now, in those circumstances, getting the right deal for Scotland would be actually not to leave the EU, but if a deal can be found in those circumstances, it can be found to work for Northern Ireland and for Scotland. John McAlpine to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you very much. Uh, in this deal, Northern Ireland, which voted Remain, is guaranteed a special deal to stay close to the EU. So where does the Cabinet Secretary see this leaving Scotland, which despite, despite having had the highest Remain vote of any UK nation, is being left high and dry with our democratic voice ignored? Cabinet Secretary. I would simply go back to the, the account of the conversation I gave with David Davis. There was a root and branch refusal to accept differentiation at the beginning of this process. Uh, when that became essential for Northern Ireland, uh, there was a view from the Prime Minister, I suspect, because she controls everything or tries to control everything, there was a view from the Prime Minister that no ground should be given to Scotland. And we know in terms of the briefings that we now understood took place to say to the EU that nothing must be drafted that would assist Scotland, that there was essentially a negative, dog-in-the-manger attitude from the Prime Minister that has affected this. We continue to argue that another way is possible, and we will go on arguing that. Mark MacDonald to be followed by Liam Kerr. The draft agreement appears to offer no guarantees on the future ability of the UK to be involved in European reference networks, which allow knowledge and expertise about rare diseases and work on treatment and cures to be shared across Europe. Now, I appreciate the many issues the Cabinet Secretary is wrestling with, but will he offer his support for the Genetic Alliance campaign to protect involvement in ERNs and undertake to raise this matter with the UK Government, given that for many people this could literally be a matter of life or death? The member makes a very good point. It is, it is one of the issues which causes enormous concern, and of course there are many of them. Uh, if the member would like to write to me or come and see me and give me that information, perhaps with the organisation, uh, I've seen the outline information, I will undertake to take it forward. Uh, on a general point, there are whole areas in this where, although issues may be referred to in passing, nothing is tied down. And the process of tying down this material and information will take years. Uh, the real problem that we now face, if, if anything like the Prime Minister's deal were to go forward, is that we would then be faced with an implementation period that would have to be renewed, and at any time during that, we could see a, a collapse in talks, but also we will be in that limbo for a long period of time. None of that is necessary if we took a single market and customs union approach. Liam Kerr to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In December 2016, Michael Russell stated, that membership of the single market is, and I quote, clearly not going to happen. What's changed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the member would have to remind me of the exact context of that. Unlike, unlike, unlike Mr Kerr, I don't, I don't go and try and uh, scra uh, scrape through my previous speeches trying to quote me out of context. Membership of the, membership of the single market and, and customs union is essential. It is absolutely essential. We have said so, we have said so from the beginning, and we have had... We have had the backing 
of the Scottish Conservatives. We've had the backing of Ruth Davidson. We've had the backing even of Adam Tompkins in that matter. So in all those circumstances, I say today, as I have said last year, and will continue to say, we need to be in the single market. That is it. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What's been announced is an agreement on the UK's withdrawal from the EU. The long-term relationship is yet to be agreed. Indeed, the political declaration detailing this is only seven pages long and provides no firm commitments to the nature of the future economic relationship. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the risk of a blind Brexit is now a very real one? Cabinet Secretary. It is true that the blindfold aspect of this, which has been much discussed in recent months, has not diminished. Uh, there is an expectation that we will might see more of the political de declaration next week. But of course, the political declaration is not legally binding. The, the exit agreement would be legally binding. The political declaration is aspirational. Uh, and then you have the immensely detailed negotiations that have to build upon that to get the final relationship. That will, will take a great deal of time. I think we will know more when we see the full political declaration. But I think there will be aspects of this if it were to go ahead in the way that Theresa May wants it to go ahead. And I think that's highly unlikely, given where the House of Commons sh has shown itself to be today. But if they were to go ahead, then there would be whole areas of which we knew absolutely nothing. And we would have no purchase and no heft in negotiations. Polly McNeill to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Given the many references in the statement to a special status for Northern Ireland, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the focus should really be the permanent membership of the customs union because that protects the interests of all four nations and also protects the peace agreement in Northern Ireland. But importantly, it allows Scotland and the interests of all the other nations, including Northern Ireland's economies and interests to be equally protected. Cabinet. I agree with the member that a, 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 an agreement from the UK to stay permanently in the customs union would be a big step forward. It would not, in my view, give us enough in terms of the single market issues, but of course the single market can build upon a customs union, and if there was an intention to do so, that would also be a step forward. Of course, we don't have anything like that at the present moment. So I am, I am preparing myself for all sorts of eventualities, but one of them has to be to say that if this were to happen and that Northern Ireland were in that position, then Scotland would have to be in the same position as Northern Ireland in order, for two reasons. One is because it's, would, we would find it necessary, but the second reason is it would be very difficult for us to compete with Northern Ireland. For example, in terms of European investment, uh, in terms of European workers, we would simply not have a level playing field. But I agree with her, you know, the best solution of all is for the whole of these islands to stay in the EU. That would be a much, much more sensible decision. Bending that, then the decision you move from that, you need to move as little as possible from that. And staying permanent in the customs union is uh, not as bad as some of the things that Theresa May is proposing. Annabel Ewing. Presiding officer, no mention of Scotland in the 585 page Brexit document. No briefing for the Scottish government. What happened to the 2014 entreaty lead us, don't leave us. Cabinet Secretary, is it not just the case that the so-called respect agenda simply does not exist? Cabinet Secretary. I think um, the member is correct. I made that point in my statement. I, I think it is a sham, a complete sham now. And, and I noticed when she was asking a question, there were mutterings from the Scottish Conservative front bench. They don't want to confront the reality of this, that the arguments that they put forward in 2014 turn out to be completely and utterly untrue. They were, in other words, presiding officer, a lie. Oh, I'd be urge caution about using such language in this chamber. Uh, that concludes our statement on the e uh, UK-EU withdrawal. Uh, and we're going to move on to our next item of business, which is a debate on motion 14749 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on physical activity, diet and healthy weight. Can I just uh, suggest, I, I allowed that statement to move on, so I'm going to have to suggest to the members speaking in the open debate that they trim their speeches from six minutes to five minutes. So all of those speaking in the open debate, which includes Bruce Crawford, Stuart Stevenson, Emma Harper, John Mason, Liz Smith, Tom Mason and Ian Gray, uh, five minutes rather than six minutes. And apologies that we have to do so, but I think there was a healthy political interest in the previous subject.